welcome you to our fourth class in our Winter Bible class of 2022. We're grateful that you are a part of this class, or is it the fifth? Time flies. I think it's the fourth. But we're studying the ten words, and we're down to the last one of the ten words. You shall not covet. On your outline, we're at number three, the preventive application. And we began looking at that last time. We talked about in order to prevent covetousness, we need to realize the channel of covetousness, and that is the heart. So it's coming from what we're thinking. And then we had just begun, little b on your outline, Remember the consequences of covetousness. And we stress that covetousness has a psychologically degrading effect upon an individual. And I was developing that with five things that you do not have on your outline. We had begun with, it destroys previous success. And I mentioned Achan in Joshua 7. 36 men died at Ai because Achan was covetous and violated God's command in Joshua 6. Don't take anything of the spoil. That is mine, Jehovah said. And you're introduced to concept of things that are devoted to Jehovah. And you often see it referred to as the devoted thing. The devoted thing. Or something devoted. And what that means is Jehovah says that's mine and no one else has a right to it, whatever it might be. And in this case, in Joshua 6, it was the spoil of Jericho. Jehovah said, that's mine, that's devoted. Sometimes persons are devoted to Jehovah. They're set apart for him. No one else has a right to them. And then in Luke 12, we remember the story of Jesus of the rich farmer. Had a bumper crop. Everything's overflowing. The idea of superfluity there. And he said, I'm going to hoard all this for myself. Build bigger barns, and then I'm going to tell myself I can just take it easy and don't worry about a thing. Don't be concerned about others. And Jesus said, you foolish one. King James there, I believe, says thou fool. And the idea there, one who is foolish. This night is your soul required of you. Your life. Then, whose will all these things be that you've stored up? And when you go to the funeral of a rich man or a poor man, a rich woman or a poor woman, you stand at the casket and you ask, how much did he or she leave? And the answer is the same. They left it all. Don't take any of it with you. Some people who don't know their Bibles have thought you could take it with you. Remember the Egyptians thought there was an afterlife in which the individual would live somewhat like he lived on earth so they put food and ornaments and all kinds of things in the tombs for the afterlife. Some, I, I remember reading a story many years ago of a man who was buried in his Cadillac. That's back when the Cadillac in America was considered top, top notch. You drove a Cadillac. And 
One fellow said all the way through his life, he said to his family, one of these days I'm going to ride in a Cadillac. And he died. And on the way to the cemetery, the son looked up from the car following the hearse, and on the back of the hearse it said Cadillac. So he finally rode in a Cadillac. Too late. One man put all of his money in the attic. He said, when I go to heaven, I'm, uh, when I leave, I'm going to take it with me. He died. His wife went to the attic. There was all that money. He said, I told him he should have put it in the cellar. <laughs> Don't know much about that, but that's the way it goes. So you're not going to take it with you. If you've been successful and you become covetous, it'll destroy that success, whatever it is. You remember in Luke 12, this is precipitated by a man who came to Jesus and said, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. They're fighting over inheritance. Now that's as modern as anything can be. Families divide themselves, fighting over inheritance. And I've encouraged people, if you want your children to have something, put their name on it, if you're going to keep it. And say to them, when I die, this is yours. Tell everybody. There won't be any fussing. There won't be any fighting. Just divide it. And if you think they're going to fuss and fight, send it home for them now. It's sad to see families fall out with each other, despise each other over material goods. Because whoever gets it is still going to leave. So success will be destroyed. So to realize or remember the consequences of covetousness. Number two, it destroys interest in home and family. Covetousness destroys one's interest in his home and in his family. In Luke 15, Jesus told of the younger son. I would caution us, we take things that we hear sometimes for granted. And I grew up, and most of you did, and most of you who've been in the church have heard preachers preach on from Luke 15, the prodigal son. Wayward son. Well, we have a song. Jesus is calling the prodigal, the wayward, those who've gone astray. But the Bible never calls him that. The Bible always calls him the younger son. So that's a title we put on that. And you remember he said to his father, now, when this story begins, you can wrap this boy's life and thinking up in two words that he says to his father. And if you've been here with me very long and you mark in your Bible, you have those two words marked. What are they? Give me. Give me. That's the thinking of the younger son. Give me. That, that just encapsulates his life and where he is. Give me that portion of, my, of the goods, the inheritance that is mine. Well, there are two sons. This is during the Mosaic Dispensation. And there is such a thing then as the right of the firstborn. But we know the elder son would receive a double portion. So the younger son says, give me. And the text says he takes it and he goes into a far country and wastes it in riotous living, unrestrained living. And he gets himself in pretty mess. But notice during all this time when he has the make me attitude, he's not thinking about his home. Not think about his family. 
I think I've known young people who were growing up with the mentality, as soon as I can get out of here, I'm gone. I'm leaving this house. And they do. Many of them get themselves in a mess. But they're all wrapped up in me. Give, give me, give me. What's mine? Mine, mine. And it's cautious to us. Think about how many times I say the word mine and me and mine. Where is my mindset? Now, to finish the story, when he comes to himself, that word that's translated came to himself means to come back into his right mind. So the reason he lost his interest in home and family is he was out of his head. He was out of his head. He wasn't thinking clearly and correctly. But when he came to himself, came back into his right mind, the first thing of which he thought was home and family in my father's house. That's the house you couldn't wait to leave. Now he says, I will arise and go to my father. But now I want to come home. And when he gets back to the father, you have two more words underlined, which indicates his mindset when he got back into his right mind. And what are they? Make me. Now he's moved from give me to make me. I'm willing to be a servant. But covetousness will destroy our interest in our home and in our family. Number three, it destroys respect for the possessions of others. It destroys respect for the possessions of other people. A certain man went down, that's a geographical reference, in sea level, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves who stripped him and beat him and robbed him and left him for dead. They had no respect for his possessions. They operated by the rule of might. I'm powerful, I'm more powerful than you, Therefore, whatever I do to you is right. Might makes right. That's their mindset. Their philosophy. They take everything this man has and almost take his life. No respect for his possessions. And we see that in our world, don't we? People do not respect the possessions of others. Tear up someone else's, borrow somebody's something, tear it up, don't think of anything more about it. Don't replace it. It just happened. Of course, if you like God, you borrow somebody else's stuff and tear it yourself up while you're using it. But you deal with, I just don't respect your possession. I had to make a decision many years ago about my library. <coughs> Through years, a lot, several have wanted, have asked, do you loan books? And the answer is no. The second part of that answer is you can use anything I have as long as you use it here. It doesn't leave the building. Because one of the things people borrow and don't think a thing in the world about not returning is books. How many people check books out of libraries? No fines. For years and years and years. But it's just a book. But it's not just a book to me, it's a tool. And those same people wouldn't think about going to a mechanic shop and getting his wrench and thinking, well, it's just a wrench. That's a tool by which he makes his livelihood. So people have no respect for the possessions of others like these robbers. And we, if you 
watch the news. I don't highly recommend it. Quite depressing. You see every night somebody killed somebody for something. They carjacked somebody. They've stolen something. They've broken in. We're told by law enforcement repeatedly, don't leave your valuables in plain sight. They get out, leave their automobile unlocked and their gun in the console, and they wonder why somebody stole it. When I worked in law enforcement, we had a lady drive up in front of a 7-Eleven. Y'all know what those are? Mini marks. Got out, left her car running, went in, came back out, and the car was gone. I was working in the sheriff's office, and I just happened by the police department after they had caught the phone. And her statement was, this doesn't happen here. Well, it just did. But I go to the post office sometimes, walk by people's automobiles, and they're running. Nobody's in it. Our police chief had a way of breaking police officers from getting out on call and leaving cars. He'd come on the scene and move the car. It didn't take you but one time to learn. Take the keys out. But you see what I'm saying? Lose respect for the possessions of others. You take a church building, public property. It's really, in a sense, private, but in another sense, public. People don't think anything of doing wheelies in our parking lot, bringing heavy machinery on the parking lot. Think anything about it. It's open, it's available. And most people look at, even though this land here, parking lot and all is private, to them it's public. I want to use it, I use it. I've often said if I had a dime for every car that stops in our parking lot on, in, during the week, I'd be a millionaire in a month. It's just a button. I don't think it might be Well, here, here is this covetousness, covetousness in messing with your mind. You have it, I want it. Number four, it leads to theft and adultery. The third chapter of the book of Luke. We read of John the Immerser and a part of his preaching. Verse 18 says, And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. And then you have my favorite coordinating conjunction. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, now look at the possessiveness here, his, brothers, his brother Philip's wife, or his brother's wife, some brothers. And for all the evils which Herod had done. Also added this, above all, that he shut John up in prison. All right, now, how many of us, 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 have taught this story and we've said that Herod put John in prison because he told him he could not have Philip's wife. End of story. That's not what the text says, is it? Concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's, his brother Philip's wife. What's that next little word? Man. Coordinating conjunction that joins things with equal standing and what else? All the evils which he did. So there's more to it than just taking a room. 
That was enough. But there was more to it. In Mark 6, verse 17, Mark only brings out this segment of it that we usually talk about. When John, when Herod heard about Jesus, he thought it was John raised from the dead, verse 16. When Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself, notice that, had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. There's the motivation. Or the motivator. His brother, Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, and that's in present tense there. John didn't just say it one time. John kept on saying it to Herod. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And so Herodias had to devise a devious plan. But notice, Mark says he had married her. Now if you're taking notes, John said it's not awful, correct? Now there's a marriage recognized by the government that is sinful in God's sight. So just because the government says two people are married doesn't mean God says it. The only way two people are married is God joins them together. Matthew 19, 6. What God has joined together, not what the government has joined together. Let not man put a son. All right, here's a marriage. Governmentally sanctioned marriage. That is not sanctioned in heaven. It's adultery and not marriage. So, in our day, two people of the same sex do what they call marrying is government sanctioned, not sanctioned in heaven. The government does not settle all matters. Herod stole Herodias <coughs> and committed adultery with her. So under the law, I'll let you do the research. I, I don't need a paper. I'll let you do the research and see how he would have to remedy these two sins if he uh, would abide by the law. See, Herod is a Jew in background. If you've studied the Herod, you understand that. They often know. And then it leads to mental frustration. Or one who develops an earnest desire, see so covet, desire, to acquire something that belongs to another, finds out that he is incapable of getting that thing. In Luke 15, 25 to 32, you have the last of the four illustrations in that chapter. About the older son. What the older son wants is the recognition the younger son receives. And he tries to get it in the wrong way and finds out he does not acquire it. So 
So covetousness causes people to be mentally frustrated. I want that, but I can't get it. It may be I want that position that someone else has. I find out I cannot acquire it. I'm mentally frustrated about that. And that goes on a lot of things in life. Questions or comments on these five things about the consequences of covetousness? Not through, but these five are especially important. Any one. No one have what you want here? Number six, nothing can wreck the happiness of a man, one person wrote, more effectually than failure to be content with the things that he has. Envy can make a man's choicest possessions seem mean and contemptible in his eyes and fill his life with bitterness. Here's the tribe to convert these Roman numerals because our young people aren't taught us, but that's 13, Hebrews 13, 5. There the Hebrews writer says, let your conduct be without covetousness. All right, then he tells you how to do that. Be content with such things as you have. Because if you're living right, he goes on to say you have God. We need to learn, all of us, everyone in, in the world of accountable age needs to learn to be happy with what he has. That does not say it's wrong to acquire other things, but I acquire them because I need them or desire them in a lawful way. Not because I'm cutting. I have to get ahead. I have to stay up with this certain level of society. I have to be on the top. When I study with our boys and girls about getting married, and we deal with finances, one of the seven adjustment areas in marriage, I try to lead them to understand that when you first get married, you are not going to have everything your parents have worked 50 years to have. And if you start out thinking that's what you have to have, first thing you're going to do is be bottom up in debt, and you are going to have some marital difficulties. Money is one of the leading causes of marital difficulties. Because in debt, credit cards, are helpful if you know how to use them. Now, I differ with Dave Ramsey here. Dave says cut them up. Dave is coming from the perspective of folks who can't handle credit cards. And if you can't handle it, cut it up. I told a woman that one time, and she said, well, I'll just put it in the drawer. And I said, you'll take it right back out of the drawer and be right back where you are. If you don't cut it up, this won't help you. But I do not have to fill up whatever house I'm living in with furniture the second day after I've been married. I don't have to do that. And have everything that I grew up having. And one of the things that parents have failed to do, in my opinion, I'm on my sofa, I'm drunk is teach their children contentedness. Be happy with what we have. And to learn to enjoy it, enjoy life with what we have. I tell people sometimes, use this illustration in a sermon one time, 
that you can have just as much fun with potted meat and crackers on a suitcase on the side of the road as you can with fish eggs and the finest of things that people can offer you. It's not about the expense of it. But so many people are this way because of covetousness. They envy that position. They envy that financial standing. Some of the happiest times of our marriage were after we were married. First place we were working as a married couple. I made the grand amount of $110 a week. And when they told me that's what they paid me, I thought, I don't know how in the world I'll ever spend that much money. It didn't take long to find out. There were Sundays when I wrote our contribution. That was the last time we had in the bank account until I got my check there. And those were some of the happiest times we had. We didn't know it. had everything we wanted. We were having fun. Of course, the ten dollars Mama sent every now and then the letter sure did help. <laughs> but you get my point. Covetousness can wreck your happiness. And don't let it do that to you. And that's what we're looking at here. And then number seven Covetousness is idolatry. Look with me to Colossians 3. Before you look there, can anyone tell me off the top of your head what one of the themes of Colossians is that's dealt with in chapter 3 particularly? Changing spiritual clothes. And chapter 3 particularly is dealing with what? A new life in Christ. It is, but in that Christian, vein, Christian changing virtues. spiritual huh? Christian virtues. No, changing spiritual clothes. Putting off the old and putting on the new. All right, now, chapter 3, verse 1 begins how? Yeah. And the next word. If ye, King James, if then, New American Standard, that tell you anything? The then. Tells you, forget chapter 3 in your mind. You're still coming down from chapter 2 where you were raised with Christ in baptism. You go from 5 to 3. I'm sorry? You go from 5 to 3 in that, bar, in that chapter. You're going to have to help. Now. Okay, mortify therefore yourselves uh, members which were upon the earth, fort uh, fornication, uncleanliness, inord uh, inordinate affection, evil, uh, conspicuous, uh, had to Concupiscence. And, and covetousness and which, which, which is idolatry. And then then uh, you go back to those are things to avoid for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. Okay. You get it? I do now. Okay. If you hadn't hit concupiscence, I probably I'm sorry. Would have, but I'm sorry. Oh, I'll be sorry. You don't use that word. I don't. No, you don't. I dare say nobody in this room has used that word except when you read Colossians. But it does mean great desire and uh, longing for something. Yeah. I do know what the word means. Well, that's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> it means evil desire. evil desire. Desiring something that's wrong for you to have. Evil desiring. Confusing. That's what I have. See, that's an old English word. 1611 type word that we don't use very much. My British ain't that good. Do what? My British ain't If you want to 
if you want to awe somebody, first of all, learn how to say it right. <laughs> then throw it on somebody. Watch their eyes bother. But be sure you know what it means, so they might ask. Let's go back to verse 11. In him, in Christ, that you learned that in the first ten, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, that be spiritual, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, that's obedience to the gospel, having that evil heart of unbelief cut away, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also what? Raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Go to 3 1 now. If then you are raised with Christ, you go back to 12. Raised with Christ where? From the waters of baptism. Romans 6 4. We were buried therefore with him through baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Even so, we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted, buried together with him, in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's being raised out of the water. So you die to sin, you're buried, you're resurrected. Spiritually. That's that circumcision of Christ. If then you were raised with Christ, Here's the outcome of having obeyed the gospel. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your, now the King James here says, affections. Is it plural or singular? Singular. singular? singular. Set your affection. The New King James shows you where the affection is. See, that's an emotion. Set your mind. On things above, not on things of the earth. Now that's Matthew 6. Lay up to yourselves treasures where? In heaven, not on the earth. For you died. Now whom do you bury? I'm sorry? Dead folks. You don't bury life folks. See, these folks who teach you're saved, then baptized, are burying live folks. You don't bury live folks. You bury dead folks. So you're not alive until you're baptized. Spiritually. For you died. That's when you repented of sin. Were buried in baptism. And your life is hidden with Christ, through his blood, in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Well, there's your reward. Conclusion. Do you all have therefore now in verse 5? King James, therefore. Therefore, since it is the case you've been buried with Christ, and since it is the case you've been raised with Christ, and since it is the case... You're living with Christ, looking toward heaven. Therefore, put to death. All right, you've died. So some things when you died should have died with you. And notice there's an implied subject there. What is it? subject. See, it just begins with a verb, doesn't it? Therefore, put to death in that verb. Who is to put it to death? You. So you have an implied subject. Not always stated. In the King James, it says mortify. 
All right. You know what mortify means? <laughs> that was when you were offended. <laughs> Who buries people? Morticians. Mort mortify means put to death. So, man, if you didn't quit that misbehaving, you were going to kill her. That's what you're trying to get across to you there. <laughs> All the old folks used it, misused it to mean I'm exasperated or surprised. Yeah. But mortify means put to death. So the New King James <laughs> reading is helpful there. And if you write in your Bible in your King James, you might want to define those terms like concupiscence. Therefore put to death your members which are upon are on the earth. All right, your fleshly things as opposed to spiritual. Fornication is interesting that New King James here uses the right word in the text. It's the same word they mistranslate sexual immorality in a lot of other places. Now what are some of these things? Now this is not an exhaustive list, but it's showing you these kinds of things are kinfolk. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. And because of these things, what's coming? The wrath of God is coming, and who does these kinds of things? All right, sons of disobedience. Well, here, folks, in their disobedience to God, that's what they do. So if you want to know, am I disobeying God if I do these things? Yes. I am. You are. Everybody else who does this. And the wrath of God is coming upon you, upon the sons of disobedience. Now, what's implied there? You have to finish the ellipsis there. There's another sign. <coughs> it's implied in verse 7. In which you yourselves once walked, once, once, present tense, present tense, you once walked, past tense. That's what you used to be. You once walked when you lived in them. But well, what's implied? I'm sorry? Okay. And when we read, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, what would finish the ellipsis there? No. Okay. No. No. The wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience if they do not repent. Because you were this way, but you repented. You used to live this way, but you don't more. Now, that's, that idea is parallel to 1 Corinthians 6, 11. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. See, here's what you used to be. You obeyed the gospel. You, were, you died to this, this lifestyle. You were buried with Christ. You were raised with Him. If then you were raised with Him, don't act like this anymore. So you see why repentance is changing your mind about living in sin on purpose. So covetousness is idolatry. If you were to ask covetous people, where's your idol? They would tell you, I don't have one. If you said to them, you're an idolater. Well, I am not. I believe in God as much as you do. No, you don't. Because you've made a God out of your things. Out of whatever you can. So just like those folks in the Old Testament cut a tree down and made a God out of it, you have found something. If 
your covetous. And you've made a God out of that. When you make gold your God, you're in trouble. You're covetous. With me? Questions or comments? Or anything else. Gold or anything else. Yes. He finished the ellipsis. Correct. And that's why I'm telling you, this is not an exhaustive list in verse 5. It's these kinds of things, this kind of lifestyle, this class of things. There is no one passage in all the Bible that lists every sin somebody can commit. So in Galatians 5, the works of the flesh, you have 15 there, or 16, depending on which translation you use. And then you have... And such like. All their kinfolk. So covetousness is idolatry. Number eight, no covetous person can be saved. Now that's a broad statement. So you finish the ellipsis unless he repents. The likelihood of a covetous person repenting, we don't know. It depends on the person and how deep he gets into this covetousness. See, in Jeremiah 7, Judah had gone so far in her sins that Jehovah said to Jeremiah, don't even pray for them because they're not going to repent. So you can get so deep into a sin or sin that you won't repent. In Ephesians 5, start in verse 1, what's your first word? Wherefore, therefore, what's that tell you? I'm sorry? Ignore the chapter of vision in your mind. Therefore, be What's this word? Followers. Huh? Followers. Y'all have followers, King James? <laughs> Do you have the Dixon? Okay. That's the 1885 edition, the revised version. Followers there comes from the word from which we get our word mind or mimic. So the New King James, therefore be imitators. My. Mimic these people. Be imitators of God. See in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said, therefore be imitators of me as I am of Christ. You mimic me like I'm mimicking Christ. Here, they're told, you mimic God as dear children. Our children mimic us as parents when they're young. When I taught school preaching, my students mimicked some of my actions and didn't think I knew about it. Until one day I called one to the front of the room and asked him to demonstrate what I looked like pulling down the mouth so that I couldn't preach. <laughs> which they got a kick out of <coughs> Mimic. And, so we have to be imitated of God. <coughs> and walk in love also, or as Christ also has loved us, and given, given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for, do you have a sweet savor, King James? Sweet smelling. <coughs> okay. And the savor is an aroma. Sweet smelling aroma. <coughs> then a contrast. All of you have that in verse 3. But fornication and all <coughs> uncleanness or covetousness. So you're in parallel in Ephesians and Colossians. Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints nor filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, 
which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, or know this, some translations, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor a covetous man, now notice, who is an idolater. See, that's even more plain if you can be more explicit than Colossians 3. Has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, see, that's what's been listed here, and everything like them, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Conclusion. You all have therefore, verse 7, or wherefore? Therefore do not be partakers with them. Leave it alone. But notice here, covetousness is idolatry, and no covetous, covetous person can be saved unless he repents which Colossians said, those in Colossae had done. And 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, some in Corinth had done. So if you fall into one of these sins, you can be forgiven. There is no sin of which one will repent that cannot be forgiven. There is no unforgivable sin if one will repent. Allow the blood of Christ to wash you clean. So if you talk with someone who says, I have done too many bad things for God to save me, that's not true. And these are passages that show you that. And you will find sometimes people who think they have gone so far that God couldn't love them, God couldn't save them, they've done so many bad things. That's just not true. If a person will change his mind about living like that. Questions or comments? The consequences of covetousness. Now there's your week after next sermon. I got it. Write it all down. But learn how to say concupiscence or find the other word. I already said it once because I already gave this lesson this year. Did you say it like you said it tonight? No. Oh, well that's good. I <laughs> Did you do worse? Not any better. You did better? Yes. Did anybody know what you were talking about? I told them about it. That's helpful. <laughs> because most likely they did. That's right. And I do have evil down in my book. Well, that's settled. If you wrote it in there, that's settled. I do? Yeah. So having a room full of volunteer collection is not a thing. You have to them. help me there. I'm not with you. Well, Say uh, I collected Tennessee balls stuff. May the Lord bless you. And take care of it. And as long as it's in its rightful place, I can collect those things. Absolutely. Open up the room and it's all orange. Yes. Yeah. You want to do that for <laughs> Yes. Yeah, some of us will pick red and black. <laughs> Roll Tide. <laughs> For those of you watching overseas, ignore all of that. The yes, it, it is not wrong if you got it lawfully and you didn't short God in service or in giving and that kind of thing, and that's not your God, then yes. can't tell people you can't have anything. See, the Bible doesn't teach you to live in poverty on purpose. But it does teach you to use what God gives you the way he's authorized. So if you tear down that room and build a bigger room instead of helping some folks you could help who are in need, you have a problem. Which is the rich farmer who is what he said. So yeah, I would say to my soul, we're going to win a championship one day. And I'll have all this paraphernalia. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's good. Yes, that, that, no, that's 
not condemned as long as you're doing it according to scriptural guidelines. Yes. I know some people think things like that, yeah. you know, especially using the word idolatry. Well, first place, that's not your shrine. You don't go in there to worship. If you do, you really have a problem. In the second place, if you've not made that your controller, and you'll do anything to add to it, you'll do anything to add it, you've not let it take over your life. So the people who would say that's wrong are saying it out of their own mind, but not out of the scriptures. And it makes scripture. All right, other questions or comments? Yes. So back to uh, no sin is uh, not able to be dirty. You know, if yes. you ask for it, what about in the case of like suicide? Does that depend on how your relationship with God is? We cannot pass judgment on suicide for a number of reasons. We don't know the mental state of the person who did it. We don't know the relationship of that person with God at the time he did it. Now the Catholic Church teaches that suicide is a mortal sin for which you cannot be forgiven. And some denominations do not. But the Bible does. We leave that one with God because that's beyond our ability to make a decision concerning. Never know. You don't know them. if a person who does that even has a clue what he's really doing. Now, there's a difference in doing it than threatening. If someone threatens you, right then you intervene and get them help. Don't ever leave them. You call somebody to get to them and get them help. And if someone says, I'm going to commit suicide, ask this question, do you have a plan? If they do not have a plan, they're spouting it, but they have not yet made up their mind to do it. If they have a plan, don't leave them. Get them help. But I, can, I have to leave that one in the hands of God. That's a good question. If it were, the Bible would tell us that. The only sin that the Bible ever talks about, of which one can never get forgiveness, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that's attributing the works of Jesus to the devil. And nobody today is going to ever be found in that position because we won't ever see Jesus work a miracle. So that was applicable to those Jews, national Israel, who were attributing Jesus' work to the devil. That's not a universal application for all men all the time. And even they could have been forgiven if they repented on Pentecost and were baptized and loved Jesus. Watch them. So there's no sin for which you cannot be forgiven if you will repent. Now the fact you will repent means you are in control of your faculties. You have an opportunity to act on them. So our work, and you see repentance is changing the mind. You have to do that intellectually, not emotionally. You have to change people's mind intellectually. You don't play on their emotions. Don't change their mind that way. You may get them to act in a certain way, but when that when the emotion of that wears off, they come right back to where they were, and they're either where they were or worse. Because the emotion wears off and they don't know why they did what they did. And I've dealt with people that way. So most of you know who've heard me preach. I want people to walk down the aisle who need to walk down the aisle, not folks I can get emotionally upset about something. And they respond, and when they go home, it all wears off. They're back doing what they did before they walked down the aisle. Plus, repentance is not walking down an aisle. Repentance takes place before you ever walk down an aisle if you need to make a public correction. 
repentance is changing your mind about believing. And then immediately you ask God to forgive you, and the forgiveness is taken care of, 1 John 1, 9. Then if you need to ask help in correcting it, that's what one does when he responds. He's asking for help in some area. A Christian I'm talking about. I grew up thinking the repentance was coming down the aisle. But that's not what the text teaches. So yeah, I, people often ask me when I go on a meeting, did you have any responses? And my answer always is yes. How many? As many people as we have in the assembly. Everybody responded one way or the other. That's why the scoreboard doesn't mean anything to me. That's not the way you gauge the congregation. I'm off my soapbox now. Let's take 10. All right, having now looked at the channel of covetousness, which is the mind, and the consequences of covetousness, then let's think about little C on your outline. Recognize the cure for covetousness. Now, it doesn't do us a whole lot of good if we know the problem, but we don't try to find the solution. So let's cure the problem. One writer said, there is in the wording of the command, this command in Exodus 20, 17, you shall not cut it, and then he gives the detail of it. He said, there is in the wording of the command a sevenfold stress that should deter covetousness. Thy neighbors, your neighbors, is used three times while his is used four times. These words stress that it is unlawful for one to desire these things because they belong to someone else. Now that's the argument Joseph used with Mrs. Potiphar in Genesis 39, one of them. Potiphar's given me everything in this house but you, because you're his wife. Some things don't belong to me. So you look at your neighbors three times, his four times, there's a stress in that. And one of the things I've tried to stress since I've been with you I guess I've done it all my career, is the importance of every word in the scriptures. Sometimes we take words for granted. We just read the words, but we don't pause on those words and look at how they work in the sentence, the syntax of it, what's involved and how it's used, what's it stressing for us. <clears throat> and here it's stressing possession. This is the possession. Now we notice one of the consequences of covetousness, it downgrades your respect for the possessions of others. So there are just some things that don't belong to us. So the cure is recognize some things don't belong to us. That's, that's one of the cures. Everybody have all you want with this? Anyone not? And then second, a cure is that God knows our heart. When God sent Samuel to anoint David to be king in 1 Samuel 16, remember Jesse brought out all of his sons but one. And when Samuel saw Eliab, he said, well, surely, surely, verse 6, Jehovah's anointed is before him. Surely Eliab is the king. 
first word in verse 7. But Jehovah said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance. Or at his physical stature. What's King James say there? The height of his stature. Okay, the height of his stature. The physical stature. Because, and now you have four. Because I have refused him. I've rejected him. For, that's the idea of because. This is the way I do it. For Jehovah does not see as man sees. For man looks on what? On what? Outward. Outward. Contrast. Jehovah looks at the heart. So Jehovah sees the inside. So if I'm coveting, I may hide it from you, but I don't hide it from God. So if I recognize that God sees the heart, that may be a deterrent. In 1 Kings 8 and verse 39, This is Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple. Begin in verse 37. When there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone, or by all your people, Israel, when each one knows the plague of his own, what? That's talking on the end. And spreads out his hands toward, toward this temple. What is spreading out the hands toward the temple there? Don't ask me, I'm tell me. It's prayer. Where they often pray with holding their hands. Psalms 24. Who shall ascend into the hill of Jehovah? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. I believe that's verse 3 and 4. 1 Timothy 2. Check me out here. I believe verse 8. I desire that the men, and there the Greek word is a near, or derivative of a near, which means a male. I desire, therefore, that the men pray in every place. Now look at it. Lifting up holy hands. So that's a reference to prayer. That's a way of saying it twice. That the men pray in every place, praying as holy men. That doesn't have a thing world to do with physically raising your hand during your service. First Kings 8.39, when they pray, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways, now look at it, whose heart you know, for you alone know the heart of all the sons of men. Look at Acts 1. Peter stands up with 120 and says, we need to replace Judas. And he gives the details of Judas and quotes two scriptures from the Psalms to apply in Acts 1, verse 23, they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, now look at it, who knows the hearts of all. 
literally there, they prayed to the heart searcher. The heart searcher. You search the heart. You know the heart. Well, that's your mind, see. And covetousness takes place in the mind. sins, it starts out with they refuse to have God in their knowledge. Their thinking is all messed up. That's why repentance is necessary to obey the gospel and necessary to be restored for a Christian. You have to get your thinking back right. When we sin, our thinking has gotten out of whack somewhere. Questions or comments so far? 1 Timothy 6. Getting at verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, Anybody have sound words there? Anybody have wholesome? Okay. The wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to, you may have doctrine here, teaching, which accords with godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, see their thinking messed up, and destitute of the truth, who suppose, see when you're getting to supposing, now you're guessing, you're not thinking logically who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourselves. Now, godliness with contentment is, notice this, great gain. If you're godly and you're content in your godliness, then you gain greatly. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food, and you may have raiment here, food and clothing, therewith or with these, we shall be content. That's parallel, isn't it, to Matthew 6? Don't get all bent out of shape, concerned about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Contrast, but those who you may have are minded to be rich. Anybody have that? Those who are minded to be rich. You have something besides those who desire to be rich. Will be rich. Those who will be. That's their will. Your emphasis there is that's what they want. That's their desire. That's their will. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and snare and many foolish and harmful what? Lust. Lust. See the desire there? Which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is and you have in the King James here the root. It's not a definite article there in the original. Is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness what do you have there? Covetous. Covetous. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Now a lot of people misread verse 10 and they read for money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's not what it says. 
God nowhere ever condemned us making money. He condemned money owning us. Where would we be in the church without folks who know how to earn a good living and give thereof? And I commend you for our contribution because of your conversion to God. Me too. But you, O oh man of God, Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of literally the faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So contentment here, according to Thayer, means a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. You're at a point in your life that you don't believe you're in need of something else. You are, we would say, perfectly content, completely content where you are. Now, if you're blessed with other things, that's icy. That's an addition. I don't have to have that. I'm thankful for it. I want to use it right. That's an additional blessing. Philippians 4.11 Paul is commending the Philippians for sending financial aid to him in preaching the gospel. He said you wanted to help me and you couldn't because you didn't have opportunity at that time. But he said not that I speak in regard to now King James you want or if that's need. I'm not speaking because I need something. For I have, and here's your key word, I have what? Now Paul said I went to school with Jesus. And I've learned something. I have learned. See, it's learned behavior. You don't fall out of bed being content. You have to go to school to Jesus to learn content. I have learned in whatever state. Now, state there means what? I'm sorry? Condition. Whatever condition I'm in. Somebody misread that and said he never had lived in Mississippi. I have learned the learn process in whatever condition I am to be what? And then he goes on to say I've been on both sides of it. I've been where I didn't have anything and I've been where I've had everything. But I've learned to be content wherever I am. One fellow used to say when he invited people home to lunch he said we're glad to have you. And we hope this is good enough for you because if it's good enough for the wife and children, it ought to be good enough. And that's right. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, Your conduct, there's your manner of life. You may have a King James conversation there. Uh, that's manner of life. Let your conduct be without what? Covetousness. All right, how are you going to do that? Content with such things as you have. Now look at the number of times in dealing with covetousness, the Holy Spirit has used the word content. And one of the problems that beset so many people in the world is discontent. It's not content. I'll tell something else. So contentedness. 
Then number four, we must remind ourselves that we are responsible for controlling our desires. I say that's getting your thinking under control. In 2 Corinthians 10, Verse 5 particularly, but we begin the sentence in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not carnal. That word means fleshly, of the flesh, out of man. But mighty in God. See, our our weapons and our spiritual warfare don't come from the flesh, from man, but they come from God. Or pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, you may have imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, now look at it, bringing, what's the next word? Bringing what? Bringing into captivity what? Every. Every thought. Bring it into captivity. That means you're in control of it. It's not in control of you. To the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience. disobey the obedience to Christ, be willing to punish yourself, that's repentance in one sense, to change your mind about that, or to receive the punishment that is meted out by God when your obedience is fulfilled. You, I, am responsible for my mind. I can't put it in neutral and just let it roam. I have to be on top of what I'm thinking. And all of us, all of us need this. It's so easy to put our minds in neutral and just let them go, and usually when we do that, they run off the cliff somewhere and they all run to be. So stay in charge. Stay in control of my thinking. Some people used to say when you get angry, take a deep breath and count to ten. What that's doing is giving you time to cool off and get your mind settled before your mouth starts running. So others have said that put your brain in gear before you put your mouth in action. That'd save all of us, wouldn't it? Think about what we're to do. I fail there. I always think like I should about what I'm saying, and I say the wrong thing. One writer said, Man is the kind of creature who can destroy himself by choosing, notice that, that's a key word there, not to discipline. It's up to me. It's not up to you to control my thinking. It's up to me. So I need then to recognize the cure for covetousness. Right? They want to have all you want with this. Now, these are the ten words. That takes us down through verse 17. Exodus 20. Questions and comments down to this point. Not because I teach the class, but the 
because we've studied it together. Do you see there's more than the ten words than normally has just been taught? Now, that's your background, see, to the time of Jesus and his dealing with national So, Jesus, this brings you to Roman number four, Jesus summarized the ten words. I had a co-worker one time, not here, who learned pretty early on that he didn't want to know everything I would tell him if he asked me a question. So he, he would preface his question with, what is the short version? In Matthew 22 and in Mark 12, and I gave you those, beginning verse 34 of Matthew 22, what's your first word? But, what that said, you need to go back up and read what's been going on. The Sadducees have been there asking. The Pharisees have been there trying to trip Jesus up. So Jesus silenced the Sadducees. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, and a lot of people miss this, and go right to the lawyer. The lawyer is a Pharisee. By the time you get to Matthew 22, you ought to know something about the Pharisees and Jesus. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked, and here it is, testing him, trying him, tempting him, you may have. See, the Pharisees didn't want to know. They were just trying to trip Jesus up. I've had people in class ask me a question to try to trip me up. They didn't want to know the answer. Teacher, which is the great what? All right, now he knew as well as y'all know there were ten of them plus the book of the covenant. So he said, I want you to boil it down to one. Which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love Jehovah your God with what's your biggest little word? All your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now he's coming, just like he did with the devil, he's coming out of Deuteronomy 6. So you love God supremely. Now question, if I love God supremely, which of the ten words will I omit? So he's saying, all of them, is the great commandment. Because all of them require you to love God supremely or you won't do a one of them. Unless you do it from a different kind of motivation. Something in it for you. Now he didn't want to know the second. He wanted the short version. But Jesus said, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the first four of the ten words deals with what? The next six deal with what? All right. Now, if I love God supremely and my neighbor as myself, have I dealt with the ten words? So 
Jesus said all about them. On these two commandments hang a double L, the law and the prophets. So these two support all the law and the prophets. And that's one of the those are two of the three divisions Jesus made of the Old Testament in Luke 24. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms is what he used there. All right, notice then, as we look at the outline I gave you, verse 34, what the Pharisees heard. They heard that Jesus had muzzled, that's what that word silence means, he had muzzled the Sadducees. What did they do? They gathered themselves together. Now here's a plot. They're always plotting against Jesus. Like later, they will do with Paul. What one Pharisee, a lawyer, one skilled or learned in the law of Moses, what a lawyer is. Now today when we hear the word lawyer, we think of civil, criminal law. But this was law the law of Moses. He was skilled or learned in that law. Now I give you the passages of number one. Jesus dealt with lawyers on different occasions. He's dealing with these Pharisees, these skilled people in the law. He asked Jesus a question of supremacy. He was trying Jesus, what the Pharisees and Herodians had done up to verse 18. He addressed Jesus as teacher. Rabbi, honored one. And Jesus answered the question. Quoted Deuteronomy 6 5. I mentioned the same chapter in which Jesus took the devil. He stressed the unity of God. Look at Mark 12 and Mark's account of this, verse 29. This is the way Deuteronomy 6 5 begins. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God, Jehovah is one. So he took him and stressed the unity of God. And what Jesus quoted out of Deuteronomy 6 4 in the, to the Jews was called the Shema. statement of faith recited daily by every orthodox Jew. So he said, here's what you've been saying every day. You've been answering your own question every day. But you don't, you've been saying it, but it's just something you've said. Shema means to hear. Hear a wisdom. And three things about God there. He's absolute deity. Elohim. Jehovah our Elohim is one Jehovah. Number two, he is absolutely one in unity. And number three, he's Jehovah, the covenant of God. So he is absolute deity, Elohim. He's absolutely one in unity, and he is Jehovah, the covenant keeping God. And by all control. All right, so he stressed the unity of God. Now, in thinking about them saying this day by day, I'm on my sofa. Have you said your prayers? Is there a difference in saying prayers and praying? Or can there be a difference? Yeah. We can just say words and call it a prayer or we can pray. 
I think for a lot of us, when we were in school, give us this day our daily bread. God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food became rote words. And we finished it in our minds with, let's eat. It's just something we said. Our pledge to the flag can mean that and does mean that to apparently a lot of things. The same thing can be true with reading the Bible. I have to be careful here. I don't want to leave the wrong impression. Years ago on the scoreboard, there was a sign that said, Daily Bible Readers. And before every Bible class, they'd ask, how many daily Bible readers do we have? People would raise their hand, and they'd put that number on the scoreboard. There's a difference in calling the words in the Bible and reading the Bible. I taught a teenage class years ago, and I wanted to illustrate that principle. So I said to them one Sunday morning, I'm issuing a challenge for this class, all of us in this class. If you read nine chapters a day, you can read the New Testament through in a month. So one month from today, I want all of us in this class to have read the New Testament. At the end of the month, how many of us read the New Testament through the whole class? I said, now tell me one thing you learned. You know what they learned? If you read nine chapters a day, you can read the New Testament through in a month. So you can call words, but you don't know what you've done. Now see, it takes longer to study the Bible. If you're studying out of like the, the King James and you run up on a word like concupiscence that you don't use and you don't know what it means, you ought to stop right then and go learn how to say it and what it means and write that down somewhere. So the next time you read it, you know what you're reading, you know what it means. That takes time. And wherever you read, wherever you study, I would suggest you have a good English dictionary. And when you hit a big word, and it could not, it doesn't have to be one that jawbreaker. It just could be a word we don't use that I don't know what it means. I do that constantly. I run across words people use in commentaries, and I don't have a clue what that word means. So I pull down the dictionary. What do they say here? Sometimes you'd figure it out in context, but it's just a lot easier to look it up. When I was with the School of Preaching in Knoxville, I edited our lectureship book one year, and I was reading manuscripts, and we had a fellow write a manuscript, a chapter in the book, and he used several words I didn't know what they meant. And so I grabbed my dictionary, but my Webster 7 didn't have that word. So I called over, over to the librarian and I said, would you go get the unabridged dictionary, look this word up for him and tell me what it means. I didn't know if he was using it correctly in that manuscript or not because I didn't have a clue what it meant. Evidently he did. He did use it correctly, but I had to find out what it meant before I could know that. And then allow it to be printed in the book. See, I'm learning all the time. People use words I don't know what they mean. Sometimes somebody will use a word in a conversation and I'll say, what do you mean by that? What does that word mean to you? What are you telling me? Are you with me? So this lawyer said these things every day, but he didn't know them. He just said them. And then Jesus stressed the unity of God and then a little C, he stressed agapao. We get what word that all of us know out of that word. Agape. He stressed love for God. In verse 37. Love Jehovah your God. 
Now, I want to develop that because here's the background for keeping the ten words of the book of the covenant. Jesus said, love Jehovah your God. All right? Here's your motivation. Love. What will this love bring about? And Lord willing, next time we'll try to take it up here. If you have questions or comments on what we've studied.